varying uh, concentrations, but the essence of the system is using our uh, alternative buy points, which are pocket pivots and Bible gap ups in conjunction with what we call a seven week rule. And essentially, you can use this as a way to be buying stocks and uh, handling the positions uh, as they move higher using uh, the 10 day moving average and the 50 day moving average as your uh, sell stocks or your guides, your selling guides, I should say. Uh, anyways. Bill, if you can, maybe turn the mic down just a touch. Okay. How is that? Is that a little better right there? Perfect. Okay. Uh, as Morgan said earlier, this is just for educational purposes, so we're not giving any investment advice. We're not recommending any stocks. So do your own trading and be responsible for your own decisions. So we have uh, no recommendations in this presentation, and uh, it's primarily for educational purposes. I just want to make a note that on our charts you're going to see several moving averages. So the magenta line is always a 10-day simple moving average. You'll see a green line occasionally. That's a 20-day simple moving average. Blue line is a 50-day simple moving average. The black line is a 65-day exponential moving average, which is not really something we use other than on the shorting side. Uh, a red line will be the 200-day simple moving average. And I would note that all the charts are courtesy of high growth stock investor software and or eSignal and uh, they allow us to use their charts at will and we do appreciate that. Uh, anyways, we're going to start with pocket pivot buy points. <clears throat> Essentially, uh, the name is interesting and always brings up the point, uh, the question, what is a pocket pivot? And we would say at its essence, it's an early buy point within a potential leading stocks consolidation or basing pattern. And when utilized as a buy point within a consolidation or a base, it provides an early mover advantage to the investor. And uh, it is also a continuation buy point for a leading stock that is already firmly entrenched in a strong uptrend. So we use it as an initial entry buy point within a consolidation and also a continuation buy point for those tricky times when you see a big leading stock taking off and you're trying to figure out how to get on board. Well, this gives you one tool uh, to do so, and it's a pretty reliable and powerful tool for adding to positions as well that you purchase earlier when a stock was, was still within or just emerging from its original consolidation or basing formation. So these are basically two aspects of the pocket pivot as an initial buy point and as a continuation buy point once your stock gets moving to the upside. Now just so you guys know, Dr. K, Chris Catcher will be on the general chat ask, uh, answering questions about whatever you have. So he'll be working that end of it as I go through the presentation. So I know some of you may have seen this before and you're more interested in asking some questions. You can do that uh, by IMing Dr. K and as you can see he is in there. Uh, going for it. So here we go. Next slide. Uh, one thing about pocket pivots, they are unique buy points. And I would point out that you can see here, here's a buy point coming up through the 50-day moving average. Here you see another buy point in the base. Now this actually right here, this is your breakout. So this is a standard base breakout, but you can see you have two initial entry points in the base here and here. And then this is your breakout. Now, as you move higher, you notice the stock moves along the magenta line, the 10-day moving average, and you get another pocket pivot buy point. So now that would be a spot to be adding to your position. Finally, you'll see this gap up, but we're going to cover gap ups in the next little section here. But essentially what a pocket pivot is, you see them in here within the base, and then you have your standard breakout that everybody will see. And then you have your standard base breakout uh, here that everybody sees, and then your continuation buy point along the 10-day moving average. So I am, uh, just so you know, I am watching the market as we're doing this because we actually are traders, and that's primarily what we do. So as I like to say, we're traders first and investment uh, showmen and educators second. That doesn't mean to slight uh, this presentation at all, but we are watching the market. We are in real time during market hours, and there's a very dynamic situation today going on, we think. So we'll keep an eye on this very closely. And I may be doing uh, trades as we uh, move throughout the, throughout the presentation. So <clears throat> just wanted to point that out. Anyways, 
the basic premise of the pocket pivot is that institutional buying creates new high base breakouts. Now remember, institutions don't buy breakouts, but they do create them. And we know that this institutional buying also will occur within consolidations and during uptrends. So they don't, they don't buy breakouts, they create them. They also create the bottoms of consolidations. And they also are the ones buying when you see something in a very sharp and strong uh, trend, upside trend, as it streaks higher. So we know that they're in there buying at all different points, okay? And just buying on a breakout, yes, that's a, a great place to be buying a stock. But if we think about this, where are the institutions buying and, and by watching what they're doing? In other words, looking for these sorts of uh, identifying price and volume signatures, we can track what they might be doing within the base and so get some early buy points as well as continuation buy points. So, you know, this buying, this institutional buying within consolidations and uptrends should theoretically have its particular identifying price and volume signature. Now, the pocket pivot describes that signature and provides a clear viable pivot point or pocket pivot buy point. And as well, pocket pivots are also a great tool for buying leading stocks as they progress higher within uptrends when they're already extended from a prior base breakout. So essentially, we see pocket pivots are as another way to identify institutional investors' footprints within a base or an uptrend. And I think this picture illustrates pretty well uh, what an uptrend or what a what a institutional investor's footprint looks like. Uh, these are the ten commandments of pocket pivots. We're just going to run through these real quickly. And the first three, uh, as with base breakouts, proper pocket pivots should emerge within or out of constructive basing patterns, and these should occur generally in stocks, uh, stocks with strong fundamentals showing excellent earnings, sales, pre-tax margins, return on equity, a uh, strong leader in its base, et cetera, or it should have a compelling thematic basis for consideration, and I'll show an example of this. The essential thing that you're looking for in a pocket pivot is that when it occurs, the day's volume should be larger than the highest down volume day over the prior 10 days. Now, you can have higher uh, up volume days, and those would not count. You're just looking at the highest down volume day over the prior 10 days. So as an example of this, we can see uh, down here, Monster Beverage down in here had a couple of pocket pivots where you see the volume bars are higher than any down volume over the prior uh, 10 days. You see another one here along the 10-day moving average, same situation. You see the, the blue uh, volume bar here is also the uh, higher than any uh, downside volume bar over the prior 10 days. Uh, here again, you have another one, same situation. Notice how the volume is very subtle here and very small, but it still is higher than any down volume over the prior 10 days. So that's the beauty of a pocket pivot. It's a very subtle buy point. And uh, if you're paying attention to these, you don't really need to see you know 150% above average volume or 50% above average volume to call uh, the buy point. You can simply, uh, go on the basis of it being higher than any down volume day over the prior 10 trading days. Here's another example. Mellanox Technologies gave you some buy points in here, early buy points here, and you could have gone on board. Notice you have the pullback back down to the top of the base, and you get another pocket pivot right here. So you actually could be buying on this pullback. First this pocket pivot, buy the pullback, and then you're in here. Now this is a buyable gap up, which we'll look at later. But you get the basic idea, and you can see how the essential uh, characteristic here is uh, the fact that you have this volume bar that is higher than any down volume in the pattern over the prior 10 days. LinkedIn, here's a very subtle pocket pivot right in here. And you can see in this market, it's, it's you know, frequently you'll see stocks break out. And we know that LinkedIn ran up to the 126 area. Now it's actually below its 50-day moving average today. It's trading around 109 back to where this started. But you can see that if you're buying these breakouts, you get trapped in this market, and the pocket pivot gives you a great tool for getting in earlier. Molly Corp. Now, this is what I'm talking about when you have a compelling thematic situation that overcomes uh, the fact that the fundamentals aren't that great, because you can see that you're not really getting uh, you know, massive fundamentals here. They're actually imperfect. and uh, because you see negative growth in here and in here. But you recall during this period there was a compelling uh, thematic, underlying thematic uh, theme, or the, uh, fundamental theme, rather, which was the rare earth metals. And that was a big deal, and this was actually the leader among them. You can see a pocket pivot in here. Now, notice this one's coming down, 
So it doesn't work right away. You actually want to see them coming out of a, a sort of a basing or consolidation that's uh, moving sideways. And so this, this one actually ends up working. You have another one here that actually gets the trend really going. But the, the idea here is that when they are occurring, these pocket pivots, you do want to see them coming out of a nice flat area. So when this is coming down, this is not really the type of movement you want to see a pocket pivot occurring out of. iShares Silver Trust, actually that big move last year, you know, actually two years ago in 2010, started with a pocket pivot. So it does work. We notice for single uh, commodity ETF, such as the iShares Silver Trust, and uh, you know, we've seen it also work in the GLD. Uh, we haven't really tracked it for other ETFs, but this is essentially uh, where we've been able to employ pocket pivots has been with the SLV and the GLD, and with great effect, I should add. More recently, silver had to move off the lows of uh, the summertime of August, and you had pocket pivots all the way up. And uh, finally, you got up to here, and it's topped out, and you're running around 32, 33, I believe, on silver now. But you can see how the pocket pivots could have gotten you in earlier. Another one, Pharmacyclics, a big, uh, big stock, had a big move. Uh, and that all started with a pocket pivot right there. Pocket pivots also can coincide with base breakouts or with gap ups. And so when you see this, it can be thought of as added upside power or confirmation should this occur. So we'll take a look at an example. Here's This is just a base breakout. You have a nice flat base here. It breaks out. It's also a pocket pivot, so you could be buying that. It gives it more authority, and later on the stock is able to gap up higher and continue to move on out. Same thing with riverbed technologies. Here's a pocket pivot, and here's a gap up here that our pocket pivots as well, as well as breakouts, base breakouts, and they do add uh, extra weight to the to the whole situation. Now, when we're talking about continuation pocket pivots, these will occur in an uptrend after the stock has broken out. And what you want to see is a stock acting constructively around the 10-day moving average. Now, it can undercut the 10-day moving average as long as it shows resilience by showing volume that is greater than the highest down volume again over the prior 10 days. And these pocket pivots will occur after the stock is extended from the base and you want it to occur right near the 10 day, 10 day moving average where it can be bought. Otherwise, if it's occurring from a spot extended from the 10 day moving average, then it is extended from the, it is uh, actually well extended from the 10 day and you want to avoid that. So the thing you want to do is always give the 10 day moving average a chance to catch up to any stock that you have where it's moving up very sharply. You don't want to jump the gun and wait for that, uh, instead wait for that 10-day moving average to come uh, back at you so you can use that as a reference for another uh, pocket pivot buy point. Same thing here is copy holding where you see the initial pocket pivot coming out of the base and then this is a continuation pocket pivot occurring along the 10-day moving average, an example of each kind. And uh, you know this again, this is a breakout and it's occurring on a breakout which gives you some confirmation. Then here you have the continuation pocket pivot you don't want to buy pocket pivots if the overall chart formation is in the multi-month downtrend, five months or longer. And it's best to wait for the rounding part of the base to form before buying. There are times when you can use a uh, bottom fishing type pocket pivot and uh, that will usually occur in a big leading stock as it's turning off the lows of a base. But you do want uh, the stock to, to round out the lows and, and act constructively along the lows before jumping in. So. <clears throat> That's a key point uh, regarding pocket pivots because a lot of people will see pocket pivots occurring in a stock, but it's in a downtrend coming on the way down. And we also saw in that example of Molly Corp how when it occurs after even a short little downtrend, it's less reliable than if it occurs in a nice sideways, tight, constructive uh, area. Uh, you also don't want to buy pocket pivots that occur if the stock is under a critical moving average, such as a 50 or 200 day moving averages. So. If you see it well under the 50-day moving average, but it's getting support near the 200-day line, it can be bought provided the base is constructed. So let's look at some examples of what I'm talking about. Here's a pocket pivot in Baidu. It's occurring in a clear downtrend. You don't want to be buying that. Um, and that's basically what you're looking at here. It's occurring below the 50-day and the 200-day. We'll get to some bottom fishing pocket pivots where we show some permutations uh, on this. Let's see, click this. Finally, do not buy pocket pivots if the stock formed a V where it sells off hard down to the 10-day moving average or 50-day moving average and then shoots straight back up in a V formation. 
here's an example straight down uh, back below the 50 day and back up and then this is in Lulu back in September of 2011 and you can see that that failed right there here's one in Amazon it drops below the 50 day moving average and occurs coming straight back up above the 50 day moving average so that's a V shape right there and that fails so that's suspect as well you'd rather see it occurring you can see here uh, you know, this is a nice constructive sideways consolidation. You want to see pocket pivots occurring out of that sort of formation, not this sort of thing where you have a sudden jag to the upside. So that can be failure prone. So you definitely want to be wary of those. Give me one second here. Got a couple of trades to work on. Okay, got done with that. Um, Finally, avoiding pocket, avoid buying pocket pivots that occur after wedging patterns. For those of you who don't know what a wedging pattern is, it's essentially a rally. Usually uh, it occurs after stock has come down and you get this sort of reaction rally that's occurring on very weak and very light volume. And uh, that's telling you that demand on the rally or the bounce is really not there. And so what you see is, for example, here's where we have this volume. Uh, the stock's moving up here. And then you can see the volume is actually declining from here to here. So you're rising on light volume, but you do get a pocket pivot here, but that fails. So that was occurring after a wedging pattern in Facebook. Now here's some bottom fishing pocket pivot uh, examples. Notice how you have Google rounding out very nicely, and it sets up in this little mini cup with handle. You're going real tight in here right along the 50-day, and you get a pocket pivot there. Again, it runs up higher, and you move above the 200-day. And you've got a pocket pivot there as well as here, I should note. No, actually, that wouldn't count. I should take that back. But you see how this works. And it's after the stock has been able to round out the lows of a base. And you'll usually see these in uh, big leading stocks. Here's an example, intuitive surgical, rounding out the lows of a base. Gets really tight in this area right here. And bingo, you get the... Uh, get the pocket pivot coming up to the 50-day moving average and the stock is off and running. So I'm just keeping an eye on the market here uh, just, just to note that we've got uh, looking at short positions in Apple here that's had a nice bounce this morning undercutting the closing lows uh, about three Fridays ago but you're starting to see it roll over again uh, this morning and so we're coming back after it on the short side up here just as an aside. I think the stock is probably topped. You can ask Dr. K what he thinks about it, but it looks to me like you could be in a long-term top, and you probably want to be uh, not definitely not long the stock. Anyways, here's a bottom fishing pocket pivot in the GLD. You can see it's kind of rounding out in here. It gets a little tight in here, and boom, you get it coming off the 50-day moving average here. This one's a little extended here, but this first one got you going on the uptrend. So in summary, pocket pivots essentially function as early buy points within a base or as continuation buy points. So you can use them two ways, okay? Uh, and that those continuation buy points occur once the stock is extended from a prior base breakout. And we think that it solves the problem of uh, exactly, you know, how do you handle uh, your stocks once they're up and running away from you to the upside? Let's say you bought the breakout, maybe bought a pocket pivot within the base as well. How do you add to your position and how do you handle it? once you have your position and the pocket pivot is a very clear way of uh, being able to do that I think with uh, continuation pocket pivots and it's very concise you know it's not if you're up two percent you add another whatever to your position and blah 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 uh, it gives you a very concise very specific way but keep in mind they're not uh, a panacea but pocket pivots do offer an edge in today's mar market and I think you need to always be implementing proper risk management uh, in your uh, investment operations, and that includes, you know, how you're going to handle pocket pivots that don't work because they, they sometimes do not work, and in bear markets they definitely do not work or work as well. So we'll go to Bible gap ups, moving along as quickly as I can. When you see a pattern like this, uh, you know, gap up moves usually look too crazy to buy. So if I ask most people, I show them this chart without them knowing what it is, and you look at this. Um, they think uh, that buying this is absolutely, you know, crazy, and, and you wouldn't want to be buying this. It's gone. It's left you behind, and uh, it's there's no point in trying to buy this thing right here. So I want you to imprint that on your brain there, and then look at the next chart. And of course, this is what we're looking at here. That was a viable gap up, and it takes off on a tear to the upside. So really, was it too high? No, 
and you might consider that where Crocs went from here more than doubling, it was actually was a relatively low uh, entry point, and the, the Bible gap up would have given you the tool to use to enter the stock there. And one of the things I, I really like about uh, pocket pivots, or I'm sorry, pocket pivots and Bible gap ups, pocket pivots get you in early before anybody sees the obvious breakout. And Bible gap ups work uh, because nobody believes them. And so when we think about why they work, basically when a stock gaps up on tremendous volume, the argument over the stock's price has been won decisively by buyers. So, you know, they get a, you know, a big, massive gap up, and uh, the argument is being won by the buyers hands down. And you see that uh, in terms of the volume, uh, because you'll see a sharp upside price movement, a gap up accompanied by a significant increase in trading volume, which is really the signature of a viable gap up, uh, just massive trading volume that is also a clear sign of huge institutional buying that's being done with conviction. And again, like I just pointed out earlier, Bible gap ups are aided by a unique contrarian aspect and that most investors don't believe the gap and are afraid to buy it because they think it is, quote, too high. And yeah, maybe it is, I don't know. But uh, looking at that last example, you know, maybe it's too high for someone to buy, but not if you're interested in making money. Again, we, we see Biogen uh, back in April of 2011. You have a big gap up here, massive volume. And this is really what you're seeing and what you're looking for. It comes out of this rising uh, trend channel. And uh, it's just off to the races at that point. And that's, that's pretty easy to eye, eyeball. I mean, you can get into the basic nitty-gritty of the characteristics of viable gap ups. You know, you want them to occur in fundamentally strong and sound leading stocks, and there should also be a compelling thematic basis for consideration. But you know, you, you'll see it when when you see a viable gap up. It, it's just there. It's kind of obvious that it's this massive move to the upside, and uh, there's really no no arguing over it. So even though we say that a viable gap up move must be at least 0.75 times the stock's 40-day average true range, I mean that's a statistical. Uh, designation for what the magnitude should be at least. But the bottom line is when you see a a big Bible gap up happening, it's happening and it's pretty obvious. So you know you always want to see these things also occurring within an uptrend or a constructive consolidation, not while a stock is in a downtrend. Okay. So you'll see these jerk uh, jerk up types of uh, moves in stocks that are coming down. And uh, what happens is uh, it, because it's in a downtrend, you can just get these kind of counter trend sort of gap ups in the stock heading lower, and that's not the type of gap up you want. They should be occurring out of a constructive consolidation. So just some examples. Here's Netflix on a viable gap up. Here's Lumber Liquidators recently on a viable gap up. And you know, if you're scared to death of buying these things, it's a really simple way to, to come into a stock because you are, are using the low of the uh, the intraday low of the Bible gap up as your selling guide. You know, you can add one or two or three percent to the downside just to allow for some margin of error and uh, and and also allow for more volatile stocks. But essentially the beauty of this is that you can use the low of the intraday uh, range on the gap up day as your selling guide. So it actually does give you a very close selling guide in most cases. See the same thing here in Apple. You have a big uh, massive volume gap up. This was in January of this year. Had a tiny little pullback, and you notice it probably comes underneath by about 1%, and then the thing just turns around and uh, takes off, and it has this big massive move higher. You can see here, these are uh, here's a Bible gap up, but notice how it moves below the intraday low here. So you would have been stopped out on this pullback. And of course, the stock comes back up, but you'll notice that this is actually a pocket pivot right here, and so you could have re-entered on the basis of that. So here you are, you got you use a Bible gap up to come in, but you get stopped out, but then you use a pocket pivot to come back in. It gives you a good idea of how these uh, things work in tandem. So let's see here. Give me one second here. Just checking a couple of things. Notice I notice the Dow is uh, turning red now. We see Apple moving lower after pinching up through the 550 level. Just to run in all the shorts, probably.
Here's a, uh, the viable gap if I showed you earlier in Biogen. And notice, you know, once they get long in the tooth here, this one gets a little bit obvious. So you don't want to be going into a parabolic type viable gap. But this one's coming out of a nice, you know, shallow uptrend. And so this is a little better. And you don't want to be buying into these big, uh, big uh, extended or sort of exhaustion type gap moves. Here are a couple in Herbalife, one here and one here. And then finally you get this third one. And by this time, you know, this is getting a little bit obvious. So you got to be wary. The more you see in the pattern, the, the more uh, the possibility that it's going to fail. And, uh, and so you keep that, keep, be mindful of that. But both of these seem to occur out of reasonable patterns. Here's a nice uh, gently sloping, you know, uptrend channel. So it kind of, that's pretty coherent, very tight action. So this one's pretty good. And then this one's coming out of a base on, the, on a breakout as well. So those two look pretty good to buy. But you can see on the volume, you know, there's no questioning what, you know, what, whether this is a viable gap up or not. I notice the market's starting to roll back. Now here we have Baidu gaps up. That's a viable gap up. See how it moves below uh, the intraday low. If you're allowing for 2 or 3% porosity there, that will keep you from getting shaken out. And remember, Baidu was a very volatile stock, so it's something to keep in mind. Again, you had viable gap up in Rovi Corporation, which was also a shakeout and then a breakout. And that was uh, a nice move that led to more, more upside in the stock. Apple in 2004. And this is before, really, we had codified these viable gap ups. And I just realized I was buying a lot of these things uh, already. And I remember buying Apple uh, in 2004, in October 2004, on earnings when it gapped up. And I was buying, you know, I was coming in and buying 50,000, 100,000 shares during this uptrend. And I'd go in and out. I'd have 100,000, then back it down to 50,000, and then up to 75, and then down to 25, and back up. And all along in here, I'm just kind of going back and forth. And nothing really big is happening in the stock. I remember on this day, just before they announced earnings, I asked my analyst uh, whether uh, I should be adding to my Apple position, and he told me that the stock was fairly valued. The next day, you had this massive volume uh, viable gap up. And to me, what that just meant is that you were piercing the line of least resistance, which is the top of this uh, trend channel. And it was happening on huge volume. And I went from about, I think it was 50,000 shares to about 350,000 shares uh, instantly. And of course, that thing just took off from there. But you can see how some of the best moves uh, occur off of this viable gap up uh, situation. I think that's something that. Uh, as a tool is very powerful because most people are going to sit there like a deer in headlights and not be coming in to buy these things. Let's see, moving along here, Tractor Supply had a nice slow uptrend after a Bible gap up and never looked back and never undercut the, the intraday low of that Bible gap up. So a little failure analysis shows some that fail. Uh, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, again, here's this idea, one, two, and then the third one doesn't work. Everybody's expecting it to go finally, you know, and, and they fake everybody out and they get slammed. And the stock actually dills around and I think it eventually did top. Uh, here's one, Citrix Systems. Probably not the most fundamentally sound stock at the time and immediately it fails. So you're immediately out. You know, it does tease you by going to new highs again just to tick you off. But, you know, that's what the market likes to do. So accept it for what it is. But it does keep you out of this. Intuitive surgical. Uh, this is just one that failed. And one of the things that might have been suspect is you did stall. Notice how you close in the lower part of the range down here. And then you just fail and you're out of there. So the beauty here is if you're wrong, it's a pretty quick stop out. You're not sitting around waiting for 7 or 8 percent or for Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny to show up. You, it's, it's down and you're gone immediately. So your loss is pretty minimal. And that's why I think these are uh, very easy to buy. So viable gap ups, to me, one of my favorite buy points and probably one of the easiest uh, to buy. So now we use the Bible gap ups and pocket pivots with the seven week rule. And this is a very basic system for handle, handling positions. It basically boils down to this. As a selling guide, you're going to use for any stock you purchase either the 10 day or the 50 day moving average as your selling guide. Simple moving averages, uh, 10 day, 50 day. You're using those uh, in conjunction with pocket pivot. I didn't put in Bible Gap up, but I should also point out the BGU or Bible Gap up. Pardon my writing, but you can throw that in there. Um, but 
and it boils down to how do you figure out which one to use? Well, the, the simple uh, answer is this. Stocks will show a tendency to follow one or the other. That's what we found. And uh, this tendency to obey or respect any, uh, either of the moving averages is determined by whether first it's able to follow the 10-day moving average for at least seven weeks in an uptrend. And so if it's holding along the 10-day without violating it for seven weeks at least, then you will use the 10-day moving average as your selling guide. If it immediately fails within seven, uh, seven weeks and drops below or violates the 10-day moving average, then you revert to using the 50-day moving average. So it's very simple. Follows the 10-day moving average uh, for seven weeks, use the 10-day. Does not, use a 50-day. And basically, this rule will help prevent you from selling a stock prematurely if it is simply not its nature to hold the 10-day moving average, and it tends to drop below the 10-day line often. Our studies of pocket pivots indicate that a pocket pivot buy point, which results in an uptrend that is shown to obey the 10-day moving average for at least seven weeks following the initial pocket pivot and buy point, which it also could be a viable gap up, should be sold upon its first violation of the 10-day line. Now, we've, we identify a violation or define it rather as a close below the moving average followed by a move on the next day or thereafter that moves below the intraday low of the first day. So let's look at some examples here. Pocket pivot, pocket pivot. Notice that on Chipotle Mexican Drill CMG, you get this pocket pivot and it's following the 10-day moving average for about seven weeks when you get about here. And so you're using a violation of the 10-day moving average as your sell stop. Now notice here you close below the 10-day uh, moving average here, but you don't move below the intraday low of that day after that. So that's not a violation. Now notice here you close here below the 10-day moving average here, but within several days here you move below the low of that day. That's a violation. You're now out of the stock and you would be looking to re-enter perhaps on a pocket pivot and you might notice you get one here on this day as it comes up and around the lows of the space and coming out of a little consolidation. So that looks decent and uh, you can see how you would have just been out and you're able to re-enter. So it gives you a way to handle positions, to lock in profits and then the pocket pivot or the Bible gap up give you the tools you need to come back into a stock later on if it resumes its uptrend. So that, that's how you'd be using the 10-day moving average with an example like Chipotle Mexican Grill back in uh, 2010. Now here we have Apple, you have a breakout on a pocket pivot and you close below the 10 day moving average here and you move below. So you're violating here, you're also violating here and you're violating here. This occurs, these two occur within seven weeks. So immediately once you see that, you're using the 50 day moving average as your selling guide, which is this moving average here. And you notice you have one pullback here that comes into the 50 day moving average. and uh, and it, and it finds support. So once it violates the 10-day moving average within seven weeks, as it does in the case of Apple here back in 2010, you are basically out of this and, uh, you know, well, you're not out of it, but you're using the 50-day moving average and you're, you're not going to be selling it unless you get a violation of the 50-day at that point. So this is essentially how you determine whether to use the 10-day uh, or the 50-day moving average with the stock. Very simple. If you want to find out more about this and uh, you know answer more questions you may have, we have a pretty uh, exhaustive and comprehensive facts section, FAQ section uh, on our website. You can go there, selfishinvesting.com. Also, in our books, we discuss these concepts in great detail. Trade Like an O'Neill Disciple, which came out in August of 2010, is followed up with our new book coming out this month in the trading cockpit with the O'Neill Disciples. And we actually go through... Uh, some trading simulations uh, using the pocket pivots and the Bible gap ups along with the seven week rule. So uh, that's pretty much all we have right now. Let's see, I'm looking at, let's see if I can share a uh, application. Just not sure how I do that. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, we appreciate you guys being with us. You can always check out more about them at www.selfishinvesting.com or you can email them support at virtueofselfishinvesting.com. So we appreciate you guys being here, uh, Gil and Dr. K. And uh, at this time, I will turn things over to our next guest. is Neil Yeager. He's going to talk about how to trade the open. All right, Neil, you can take it away. The next 30 minutes, the room is yours. 
not really sure what happened there. I went off uh, air for just a second there. I was trying to bring in uh, my charting module, but that didn't really work there, Chuck. I don't know where you're at or Morgan uh, kind of logged me off, so I wasn't able to bring up the, uh, the program. So I'm not going to be able to show any charts here in terms of what we're seeing in the market. All right. Well, good deal. Well, Gil, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us today. Again, excellent presentation as usual. We'll try to get the recording posted on our website this afternoon. Uh, I know we've got a lot of people in the room here, uh, and we'll email it out and, and let them review it. So appreciate you and Dr. K taking the time to be with us, and we'll have you back very soon. Okay, very good. Our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and again, you can check them out. Uh, you can email uh, Dr. Cage, put the email address in it, support at virtueofselfishinvesting.com, or just go directly to the website, www.selfishinvesting.com. All right, Neil, at this time, I will turn things over to you. Neil's our next speaker. In the next 30 minutes, he's going to cover how to trade the opening swing. All right. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Appreciate it. Test one, two, three. Let me test audio first. Two.